Uh, we're going to begin today with, uh, with Chris Brook. Chris is the uh, legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of North Carolina. He's a civil rights attorney who previously worked with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, and he's been with the ACLU since last year, right, 2012, and hopefully for many more years to come. He'll begin this event today by telling us sort of the story of this litigation and the issues that, uh, that are at hand. Then we're going to hear from our couples uh, that uh, are the plaintiffs in this case, and we'll begin, I guess we'll go in this order, is that okay? Uh, Chantel Fisherborn, uh, who and her partner, uh, wife, Marcy Fisherborn, and then we'll have Sean Long and uh, Craig Johnson, who will talk uh, about their situation. Each, each will get a few moments. And then to, to hit back cleanup today, we're going to have Chris Stroh. Chris is the executive, the new executive director of Equality North Carolina, a uh, veteran political organizer and activist and professional who uh, worked previously for Senator Kay Hagan's office. Uh, so it's, it's a great, uh, wonderful panel to talk about this critically important issue. We're glad you're here with us. Glad all the folks that are watching online are with us. And uh, so without further ado, why don't we start off with Chris. And there's a microphone there. If y'all if y'all can't hear, raise your hand. We do have microphones available. I, I'm he's exceptionally good, loud. Yeah, he's got a good uh, As anyone who has ever interacted with me is painfully aware. Uh, if, if, if anybody can't hear, I'll project even more and more forcefully. But uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Rob. And thanks to the North Carolina Justice Center uh, for having us for this discussion. Obviously, an exceptionally important issue, an issue where there's a lot of movement. I, I just really a pleasure to be on the panel with, with such great folks and friends. So, and thanks to you all for coming to, to learn more about uh, these issues because I, part of the, the reason we filed this litigation is to change the laws here in the state of North Carolina. But to me, every bit as important a reason for filing this litigation is to inform people about the impacts that the lack of second parent adoption has on families here in North Carolina, but also the impact that the lack of marriage equality and freedom to marry has on families here in North Carolina. So it's really not only a litigation effort, but also very much an educational effort. So really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, as uh, you know, Rob referenced, I started on May 1st, uh, 2012 with the ACLU of North Carolina. That was a week before Amendment 1 uh, was on the ballot and just a little bit before our legislature came to town, so everybody should pour one out for me here uh, <laughs> at some point during the course of the conversation and sympathy. Uh, but, you know, I think a lot of us remember how we felt on May 8, 2012, um, and that was obviously an exceptionally trying evening. I think it's, it, it's heartening to think about how many things have changed since uh, May 8th, 2012. But you know, I think it's also, you know, some, some of these impacts have been around in our state for a lot longer than that. Another date that I flagged for y'all was is December 20th of 2010, and that's when the North Carolina Supreme Court uh, ruled in a case called Bozeman versus Gerald. And uh, you know, fewer people in our state are aware of that date but it was the date in which the Supreme Court invalidated and held and interpreted our adoption statutes in our state as not allowing for second parent adoptions. Uh, there were a number of counties, Durham County, Orange County, Chatham County, where second ado parent adoptions had been going forward for quite some time, uh, and the North Carolina Supreme Court put an end to that. So a lot of y'all in the state know this already, uh, but what, you know, what is a second parent adoption? It occurs when one partner, an unmarried couple, adopts the other partner's biological or adoptive children. Um, and that can occur, obviously, in gay or straight relationships. Uh, obviously, there's a remedy that is out there for folks in straight relationships who do want to adopt. They can get married, and then they're permitted to adopt. There's no similar remedy available to gay and lesbian North Carolinians. So post Bozeman, the adoption landscape looked like this. If you're married, then you can jointly adopt. If you're a step parent, you can adopt your stepchildren. And if you're single, you can adopt. 
but the families you're going to hear from today uh, are not able to jointly adopt. So one parent has a legal relationship with their child, and the other parent is a legal stranger, has no relationship whatsoever under the law. Even though the day in, day out, unglamorous, and I guess occasionally glamorous responsibilities of parenting, probably not very glamorous, uh, are I exactly the same. So, you know, it really is a, a point where the law needs to catch up to the reality um, so we can avoid a lot of the consequences that they're going to speak about much more uh, eloquently than I can. But they, they range from the, the mundane and day to day, you know, uh, impacts like class permission slips in a school setting. You know, healthcare is not particularly mundane, uh, but it's a big deal when you can't extend your health care coverage to uh, your children. To, to the weighty, you know, making medical decisions is made exceptionally more complicated when you don't have a legally recognized relationship with your child and they might be in, uh, you know, a, a dangerous situation. One of the families we represent, Crystal and Lee out of Asheville. Um, Crystal is the biological and legal mom, uh, so she has a you know, legal relationship. Lee's parents, uh, Crystal's parents do not recognize her relationship with Lee. Crystal's parents are the next of kin to Crystal and Lee's two children. So if, God forbid, something were ever to happen to Crystal, at the very least, you're going to have a massive custody fight between Crystal's parents and Lee, who is her day in, day out mother, has a you know morning, noon, and night responsibility for those kids with grandparents who don't have any relationship there whatsoever. So uh, you know we filed a lawsuit challenging the prohibition on second parent adoption on June 13th of 2012. Obviously, since then, the, the Supreme Court uh, invalidated the so-called Defense of Marriage Act uh, in the Windsor case this summer. And I want to read one passage from the Windsor case because it explains what we did after the Windsor case, I think, very well. The, the court in Windsor said that the Defense of Marriage Act, quote, humiliates tens of thousands of children now being raised by same-sex couples. The law in question makes it even more difficult for the children to understand the integrity and closeness of their own family and its concord with other families in their community and in their daily lives. It's absolutely true. And that is why we amended our lawsuit to also challenge North Carolina's ban on the freedom to marry for gay and lesbian North Carolinians. Because the families that we represent really can show the impacts that the lack of being able to you know, extend all of the protections that come with marriage to your children have. So we think that there is really you know, the best stories to be telling uh, about these cases and about why we need to have the freedom to marry in North Carolina. So we filed that amendment on uh, in July of 2013. It's uh, the state. Uh, has moved to dismiss uh, that as well as the second parent adoption challenge. It's fully briefed, now awaiting decision um, by uh, the judge in the Middle District of North Carolina. So I'll turn it over to, to Chantel and Marcy to talk a little bit more uh, about the impacts. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for having us. Um, thanks for the lunch. and. Uh, Thanks for your ears and your hearts during this conversation. My name is Chantel Fisher-Born, and um, I'll say a little bit, and then Mar say a little bit, and then of course we answer questions. Um, I'm originally from Southern Louisiana. Um, I make a good gumbo, and uh, <laughs> proud of that, and uh, happy to do that soon as it gets cold. And I think just to say a little bit about our family and how we came to be part of this case, um, and tell you a little bit about how you know our motivations here. Um, we have been together about 16 years, almost 17 years. We met in Louisiana in undergrad. We got together when we were 12. And um, <laughs> just kidding, uh, we, were, uh, we were 22. And um, we have two kids, uh, Eli and Miley. Miley is uh, five and a half. She wants me to make sure you know she's and a half. It's very important to five and a half year olds that you know the half. And we have Eli who just turned two. Um, 
I, I gave birth to Eli, Marcy gave birth to, Mar to Miley, and we uh, both knew we wanted to have kids, you know, uh, even before we got together. And, um, and it was time issue of when, not uh, if, and, um, and we're blessed to be able to do that uh, together in the last um, six, five years since Miley was born. Um, and the reason we chose to be a part of this case is because, because we can sit here in front of you and be out and say who we are and who our families are without fear of, of necessarily losing our jobs and knowing that that ability for us to stand up and be out in our community is quite a privilege. Um, we've had many um, families around the state uh, talk to us about their desire to be a part of this uh, in a way that they really can't um, because they're in situations where they don't have the privileges we have of being out and we don't take that lightly. And so we know that um, it, was a, it was a relatively easy decision for us to be a part of this case because we know it's important work and it'll help lot, not only our family but lots of families across the state um, just like ours. So um, I'm going to let Marcy tell you a little more and I'll stop there. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marcy. Fisher born. I thought I'd, I'd start with just a small, small story. So I think everyone in this room is probably aware that the triangle is a more liberal area of North Carolina. I'm not supposed to say that. Um, um, so um, I, I, I say that even though I shouldn't to say that um, in what is by some perceived, sorry Mike, as a more progressive area of the state of North Carolina, we gave uh, birth to, I gave birth to our daughter Miley um, at UNC Hospital. And um, in preparation for that, with uh, the one family medicine midwife who was, is, continues to be lovely, uh, gave her a lot of paperwork, which I could afford, our family could afford to do. A lot of families can't afford to do that, but we um, have, are, are fairly well resourced and figured out what, what different paperwork we needed to sort of, as, as much as we could, piecemeal our relationship together in a legal way. So um, in advance of giving birth, uh, I provided all this paperwork to UNC. It was in my medical record. Um, I had a very long, very, very long la labor. My midwife says it's the longest labor to date that she has ever helped to support. Um, and after, after many days of labor, I uh, was transferred up to the, the, the floor where people recover post-giving post birth, and it was, <laughs> maybe one in the morning, and uh, I was immediately confronted with the nurse who said, um, who is this person here? Where is her legal paperwork? You need to produce it all right now or she can't stay. Um, and luckily, I had like an emergency suitcase with another red folder that had everything in it. Um, but um, that, that moment punctuated the beginning of our parenthood. And it was in a place that, um, Many people would not anticipate something like that happen. And I had gone to many measures to uh, prevent something like that happen, and it still happened. Um, and, and so that was a real moment for me that really highlighted the fact that um, no matter who we are emotionally and who our kids know us to be in terms of, of their parenthood, I mean, we were together over in a decade before we very consciously entered the decision to become mothers together. Um, that there will still be real challenges and that if this is our experience as a white middle class couple in a very resourced area, what is the experience throughout the state and what's my responsibility to engage and to tell our story um, in order to help create that change. So that, that's been an important piece for me. The other thing I wanted to say to the point Chris made about Kennedy's comments around humiliating children. I think what, um, when we found out that there was this opportunity to extend the ACLU lawsuit to include uh, marriage uh, and the challenge of Amendment 1, and we of course said, yes, that, let's do it, that sounds great. Um, I, I From vacation. <laughs> they answered their phone on vacation. <laughs> we were actually in Hawaii, and we pulled over literally on a cliff. And we're like, well, my kids are like in the water, and we're waiting to get on an airplane, and we're like, what, Amendment 1? Yeah, let's do it. Um, but, um, you know, for so long, the language against our families has been that it, we will hurt children. That, that our families shouldn't exist or be supported because we were harmful to children. And all of a sudden, this language in this very important national stage, 
Supreme Court gets it flipped on its head to say, <laughs> in fact, the opposite is true. What, what we've been doing legally in this country is the thing that's been humiliating and hurting children. And, um, and so I, I, I guess I'd sort of put that out to policy, for those of you engaged in caring about policy, to know that, this, that, um, that the issue of second parent adoption has a huge impact on children, um, including our children. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, Chris, I think it's also really important to know that the sort of legal mechanisms we have for uh, relation, our relationship recognition versus our parental rec recognition are, are, are different. So my understanding right now in this country is that the legal advice for those people, even in states where we can legally get married, and we actually are legally married, uh, we got uh, legally married in DC, um, that even in those states that do recognize same-sex marriage, that couples are still being advised to pursue second parent adoption. Because their rights, so even if they're legally married, they're, they're quite, they're, the tenuous nature of their parental connection uh, it will still be in question if second parent adoption is, isn't pursued. Am I right about that? I know in New York there, there's been a lot that, about... Well, if you're, if you're married, that would handle all the problems that, that come from... If your marriage is recognized in your state, then that handles everything related to second parent adoption. But if you're in your situation where North Carolina does not recognize it, then, you know, certainly it would be wonderful if you could pursue, okay, you should be able to get married, but it would be helpful to be able to pursue in the absence of marriage second parent adoption because that would uh, extend rights that are not currently recognized by the state of North Carolina. And so one other thing I'll say is that I also think the second parent, before we have added the amendment one piece, is that the second parent adoption, what we're fighting for is the ability to adopt the children that have always been ours, and to pay a lot of money to do that. So a second parent, a step parent adoption is like three hundred dollars. For it's, it's not very expensive. A second parent adoption is three to five thousand dollars. So it's it's exponentially more expensive. So the the fight is to pay money for our children to be who they always have been, which is our children. Um, and, and so even if, if we win that fight, the mechanism will still be incredibly unequal financially. And for many, a burden that will, um, will not be bearable. And one other policy thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over for those of you that, that are maybe a little <coughs> longer around this like me. Now that for those of us, like Chantal and I, we federally have a federally recognized marriage. Well, before, the IRS has decided to recognize us. So we can file federal taxes together. We can no longer, let's say we win. We get second parent adoption. Okay, and we, we decide to adopt another kid, <laughs> and that costs money. Or we decide to pay for second parent adoption, and that costs $5,000. Uh, there's a tax adoption tax credit that's available for everybody. Uh, I think, does anyone know the exact amount of the adoption tax credit the federal government? It's substantial. It's, 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 it's like $15,000, $16,000. It's, it's fairly substantial, you get over a period of years. We can no longer have access to that credit because federally we're legally married, so we can't adopt our kids legally. It's just, it's a nightmare. I don't even know if what I just said makes sense because it doesn't make sense to me. But in the event that we can't adopt, we no longer, because federally we're recognized, have access to adoption tax credit. So anyway, that's another weird policy thing connected to same-sex unions that involve children. So, John. Thank you, Arthur. <laughs> uh, my name is Sean Long. This is my partner of 19 years, Craig Johnson. We have our 12-year-old son, uh, Isaiah Johnson Long. That's my heart. Love him. Love soccer. Um, first, I want let me reiterate thanks to uh, the Justice Center, the ACLU of North Carolina, Quality NC. Um, without such great organizations behind us, uh, things would not be able to change for the better. And I also want to reiterate what Marcy was saying that the whole reason we're doing this is to, it's for our kids. We want them to have the same uh, protections that other kids have with uh, two legal parents. As things stand currently, you know, Craig is the legal parent. I am the legal total stranger that has absolutely no relation to my own son. He's in sixth grade. Even when I take him to the doctor, take him to soccer games, take him wherever, I have to be sure I have, you know, paperwork with our parenting agreement, with the power of attorney, medical power of attorney. Um, and it, it's, it's maddening. It's maddening and frustrating. Um, the very first time uh, that kid got sick in kindergarten, I had to go pick him up. I did not have my medical folder. 
I, I go in there and they just said, you know, he's not feeling well. So I'm like, okay, not a big deal. I'll go in, I'll pick him up. I pick him up. He's like, oh, Pa, I feel so bad. It's like, okay, kid, come on. I get him in the car. And we start to drive out of the parking lot. He's like, oh, I'm, ugh. and then he starts throwing up. I'm like, oh my God. So I pull over, open the door, kid, throw up. It's fine, it's gonna be fine. I'm like touching him. He's, he's burning up. I'm like, okay, this is serious. I have to get him to the doctor immediately. So I take him to our pediatrician, and I'm standing there like, oh, you know, he's running a fever, he's throwing up, what do I do, what do I do? And fortunately, the, the nurse, the doctor was totally great, but the whole time I was like, what if, what if I'm challenged? What if something happens? What if they're like, who, who are you? You know, we have, you know, Craig Johnson uh, listed as his parent, you know, you, you are not in any of this paperwork. And so I, I lucked out and we also were fortunate we had done research and chosen doctors that we knew would be supportive but it was terrifying and if it had been you know it turned out to be fine he got medicine um, but if it had been an emergency situation and they hadn't let me make a decision like at this point of crisis that would have been disastrous for him and we no no child needs to you know have the person that's their parent not be able to make these important decisions for them. And talking about the, the humiliation aspect, um, when I was signing us up at the Y, um, where he goes, he goes to like different Y camps and track out programs when he's um, tracked out of school, um, we were in the long line to get him signed up for camp and there's a family in front of us um, and they sign up, you know, the mom's like, you know, I'm signing up for me and my husband and our daughter no problem. And I walk up there and I'm like, you know, my partner and I and our son, we want to see about a role. And they're like, oh, all right. Um, we will give you, you know, one adult and kid membership and one other adult membership. And kid actually turns to me, he's like, why, did, why didn't we get the family membership, like the family in front of us? And that inside my heart was just like breaking, like, oh. I'm right. like, well, kid, and yeah, I'm so sorry, but you know, unfortunately, they they treat us differently. They we don't have the same. We are not viewed as the same type of family. Um, and the Y staff were great, and the woman behind was very apologetic, and she was saying, you know, I'm so sorry. This is something that will be changing. It's just a slow process. She was very supportive of us, but it didn't change the fact that, you know, right there at that moment, he he had that that stigma, and he knew that he was different and was being treated differently. And it's awful. That is no way a child should ever, ever feel. Um, but again, we were fortunate in that the Y was very supportive of us. Our doctor's been supportive of us. Our church community, the schools, all have been great. But still, we, we are lacking these just like basic legal protections. And that's all we're trying to get is the legal protections for our son. And it's not like we, we keep anything out of it other than more responsibility. <laughs> But it's, it's to protect him, and that's what family is. That's what we're trying to do. So uh, I'm now turning it over to my partner, Craig Johnson. Good afternoon, I'm Craig Johnson, and for those of you who are watching this at a different time of day and not live here, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and or good morning, as the case may be. Um, thank you for coming and listening to what we have to say, and thank you for inviting us to be here to say it. Um, my experience is different from the three people you've heard so far because I am the legal parent. I did not have to give birth. So I have not experienced personally the issues that the other three speakers, Chantel, Marcy, and Sean have experienced. I've seen them, but I've not lived them. Um, and what I am hoping for for my child is the same thing that I had as a child. I come from a very stable, long-term family. My parents have been together since they were teenagers. They are in their 70s now. They've been married for well over 50 years. Very stable relationship, very stable family growing up. What our son Isaiah has is two parents that have a stable relationship, <coughs> but legally the family is not stable. And that bothers me. I don't like that. I don't like it that Isaiah only has one parent legally. This does not make sense to me because of what 
I see Sean doing in terms of parenting. And if you wanted to divide the parenting role between the, the caregiver, nurturing, um, emotive, <laughs> yes, uh, I am referred to as the mean one, uh, the, uh, the unfeeling one, the strict one. Uh, I'm much more my father, and Sean is much more my mother in the, the child rearing role. And I cannot imagine how it would be to Isaiah, well I could, I don't want to, uh, how it would be to Isaiah if something were to happen to me and then he would legally lose the, the nurturing half of the, of the relationship. I say that in quotes because I also am nurturing just in a slightly different way. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, I don't want that to happen to him. And I'm very, very thankful to have the opportunity to, to speak to people who are concerned about the situation, to work with Chris, Mike, ACLU, the other folks who are involved in this case saying this is important. And I want to, to say thank you to everyone who is here, who is concerned about the families that, uh, that we're talking about. And it's surprising the number of people who don't, who don't even realize that this is an issue. I work in a fairly um, open progressive industry. It's a multinational industry. And we have same-sex partner benefits, health benefits, um, the, for all purposes of our company, Isaiah's, it's, you know, it's treated, our relationship is treated just as it would be were we an opposite sex married couple. That said, uh, whenever I first told my coworkers and managers and friends that, hey, I'm participating in this lawsuit, they're like, huh? You mean he's not Isaiah's parent already? No, legally he's not. And people who are highly educated, well in tune with what's going on around them, had no idea that this was happening, which kind of said to me that, hey, okay, um, a large part of the populace does not know what's happening. And they need to know because this is important to us as families, this is important to our children for the legal protections. Um, and so again, thank you for this opportunity. Well, I'm not going to uh, speak for too long. I know that we want to make sure that we, uh, we have time for questions. And frankly, I don't know that there's anything that I can say that, that more eloquently demonstrates the need for this crucial, very crucial conversation than what um, our couples have said already. Um, I think that it, what's demonstrated here is I've heard the words maddening, and as we heard in the opinion, humiliating. And that's that's exactly the situation. Um, and you see that even with federal advances, I'm frequently advanced when, or I'm, I'm frequently asked when um, I talk to folks from the rest of the country uh, if I'm heartened by, by what's happened at the federal level. And of course I am. Um, I'm, I'm very heartened and I'm very heartened by the direction that North Carolina's heading in. And at the same time, you hear um, stories of, of uh, couples who are going through all kinds of IRS loopholes and, and how federal advances are just absolutely uh, not matched by what's happening in North Carolina and it's, it's complicating situations terribly for people who, who don't deserve to have their lives complicated in this fashion. Um, and so our job at Equality North Carolina is really to um, run a, a companion campaign to the ACLU's efforts uh, in, in litigation. And I think the reality of the situation, I think that folks in this room know that likely um, when we do win on, on second parent adoption, and when we do win on same-sex marriage, and, and we'll win on both of those issues, that the wins will likely come at this point um, through litigation and at the national level, um, and not with the current uh, makeup of our state legislature um, at the state level. The, the country is just moving uh, more quickly. However, um, we know that outside of the General Assembly, uh, the state of North Carolina, whether it's, you know, here in the more progressive triangle and 
kind of business-minded Charlotte or um, the rest of the state where you know you've got a population that's built on values of fairness um, that we can bring people a really really long distance uh, and we absolutely have to do that you, you, you see in every state where um, equality has been achieved that the Hearts and Minds campaign has, has, been, has been won or has, has a long way towards being won. So our job and you know, where we need the help of everybody in this room is to make sure that when we do achieve these wins that um, our, our population is there. And uh, despite the, the amendment one loss, um, I know and I'm sure that, that you all know that, that we are headed in that direction. So um, we work with the, um, the elected official community to make sure that uh, you know, even if we're not going to be able to repeal Amendment 1, that we still have uh, elected officials, members of the legislature, um, community uh, mayors and other municipal electeds <coughs> who are being outspoken on our issues. And that's obviously important in order to move public opinion. Uh, we work with the business community because um, fortunately or unfortunately, um, elected officials uh, listen to the business community when they may not always listen to us. And we know that the, the business community uh, thinks that this is, a, this is a pretty common sense matter. I talked to um, a Triangle business leader recently who said that in the, the wake of uh, the amendment vote that he was having difficulty um, drawing talent to his company because folks were asking um, you know, what are, what are you doing? And so the business community is primed to step out in favor of um, n workplace non-discriminations, in, in favor of marriage equality, um, in favor of these other issues. And so we're, we're working with them to, to push them. And then um, we, I, I think really the best, the best takeaway from this is that visibility is the absolute most important way that we're going to win a Hearts and Minds campaign. Um, you, you just can't listen to stories like these and not, it, it's not just that they're compelling, because of course they are, it's how very common sense they are. And the, I mean, the common sense of being able to, um, you know, be in the room with your, your wife as she gives birth or, or immediately after being able to pick up your sick child and, and take them to the doctor. These are, these are compelling heartstrings issues, but at their core, they're common sense issues. And so, um, we, along with the ACLU, uh, run a visibility campaign through our uh, knowandlove.org uh, website. And so these are, are just a couple of the things that we are doing to make sure that um, when we do win on second parent adoption and when we do win on marriage equality, that uh, the people of North Carolina are there with us. And I, I really believe that they will be um, as long as we, you know, we are working to, to change minds at the grass tops and the grass roots. K-N-O-W and love.org? Yes, K-N-O-W and love.org, yes. Check out that website. I, I, we're gonna have questions for the audience, but I get to ask the first one because I'm in charge here. Um, Chris, can you say a little bit more about the lawsuit and sort of like, What's your fantasy that happens, or what's the <laughs> <laughs> how it goes, or what, how, how it could go? Dreaming. Well, I, I get paid as much as the people in the Macquarie does. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, I, so we are in front of uh, Judge Bill Osteen in the Middle District of North Carolina. Um, we. As I said, the, the state defendants have moved to dismiss both the second parent adoption and the, the marriage portions of the lawsuit. Uh, you know, uh, we, obviously right after uh, Windsor, there, was, there were a rash of lawsuits that were filed because it was such an encouraging decision. Uh, in Pennsylvania, for example, there was uh, a challenge to their prohibition on freedom to marry. Their uh, state's motion to dismiss was recently shot down uh, in the courts. We hope and expect that that will happen uh, in relatively short order. I would, of course, not speculate on when that will be, but hopefully sooner rather than later. And, you know, then we just want to be able to, you know, put on evidence, go to a trial, uh, tell these stories, bring forward experts who are going to, you know, make plain uh, what Chris really hit on there, which is that 
these stories are all at once extraordinary, but also extraordinarily ordinary. Yeah. Um, and I think North Carolinians uh, hearing more about that, it, it really is a common sense issue. We need to be protecting kids, moving in the best interest of kids, uh, and we need to have, have second parent adoption and marriage equality because of that. So, you know, hopefully we'll get a good district court decision. Um, at some, you know, this will, there are now, uh, the only state in the Fourth Circuit that has the freedom to marry is Maryland. Every other state in the Fourth Circuit, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, all have marriage challenges working their way through the federal courts. This matter will end up in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the, uh, the step between your district courts uh, at a state level and the Supreme Court. So we, um, we think that, that we will get into the Fourth Circuit in, one, in, in some way, shape, or form relatively soon. And you know, I do think that maybe make, time for Isaiah's graduation from high school. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, the political process has been unbelievable. But likely to, if you're going to, you know, get, we, we shouldn't have to wait on a political solution in some places. And in some places, it's going to be much harder to get a political solution. So I, I do think that that ultimately, the way we will get to 50 state marriage equality will likely be a Supreme Court decision that builds upon. Uh, the, the foundation that's been laid in, in Romer and Lawrence uh, and most recently in Windsor. Are there other questions from the audience? Who's got, I know there's some out there. <coughs> yes. Out-of-state adoptions are recognized uh, by the state of North Carolina. So if you, you have an adoption that's out of state, there's going to be uh, reciprocal recognition of that. And that just sort of adds again to another level of the uh, perversity of all of these things where you know, you're allowed to file joint federal tax returns, but you have to use a, a, a dummy state return, et cetera, et cetera. We actually tried to, um, for me to give birth to Eli in D.C. so we could both be on the birth certificate. Um, so we, I was like seven months pregnant. And we went up there, you know, we, did, we, we had a wedding a long time ago, 10 years ago, with family and food and drink and all that, a long time ago in North Carolina. And, um, and so we, we understood that, so we, Mar Miley was born five years ago. And so we thought if I, we knew that if, if you gave birth in D.C., you could both be on the birth certificate as the same time couple. We had to be married first, and so we go up there one weekend, and um, we, we did the legal paperwork, and it was, it was, it was fun, and um, and I was like, I think it was seven and a half months pregnant, and I, driving home, I was like, honey, there is no way I'm gonna get in the car when I'm in labor and try to DC and get stuck in a traffic jam in Richmond, and then have to get burned on the side of the road in Richmond. I said, like, Virginia's as bad as North Carolina, you know? I was like, what were we thinking? And so. Um, but even that, like mental gymnastics of can we do it? And is it possible? And, and we really, really, really thought about it. And the birth center in DC was like, come on up. You know, the director was like, you can stay at my house. We were like, oh yeah. God. And it's like, um, and I guess you know, for me, uh, you know, what is important and what I think I keep coming back to is, you know, I think about Miley and Eli. You know, they know who we are to them. We know who they are to us. I am. We are married by every. Any sense of the word, you know, I have to say, driving over here, Marcy was a little late, and I was like, I don't know, rough, you know, and I was like, honey, um, you know, you know, like every sense of the, of the imagination, and I think um, I am uh, grateful that in my mind and heart, I don't doubt that for a minute, and I'm grateful because I, I also know that, that the reason I can even have that in my imagination and in my life, and I've been able to build this family and this life, is because of the work of people before us. You know, this is a new conversation for me. Even for me as a teenager, I couldn't have imagined a lesbian couple living a life happy and, and alive. You know, and that is um, so. This litigation <coughs> process is a part of this piece and a very important part. And I and I just am really grateful that I know in my heart and mind that that is who I am, who we are, who our kids are. And I think the laws have to just catch up. And, and what we are going to be true. Picking up on something that Marcy said previously as well, we need to recognize that for folks who have 
lesser fiscal resources. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, folks who are on this panel are, you know, at least in some sort of fiscally secure position, right? Uh, so they could consider, even though it's unbelievably hard, right. as uh, Chantel was just talking about, going up to DC, there are tons of North Carolinians who do not have 250, let alone $3,500. You know, the time off? The time off, the work flexibility. Uh, one of the, Terry and Leslie, one of the couples in the uh, litigation, put together a health care power of attorney so they could make health care decisions for their children, $1,400. How many North Carolinians cannot afford that? The vast majority of North Carolinians cannot. So it is wonderful that these opportunities to try to do the best with a bad situation exist, but to force people to jump through and burn this sort of cash in order to do so is, is absurd. Other questions? Do we have an idea of how many couples, do we have even a rough estimate of how many families could conceivably be affected by this at some point? Anybody ever even done any of the math? Do we, do we, I don't know, it's thousands. It's in the thousands. Okay. It's thousands of North Carolina families. Makes sense. Makes sense. I've got a question. So, but the, well, I'm just interested in your opinion about the um, which way the level of discrimination that you all experience sometimes, like you were talking about at the Y, it, which way it's going in North Carolina, and especially outside of the Triangle area, like when you all you know go to the beach or go to the mountains or something. I mean, what's What's your, the level, is it the same or is it you know, less or worse? I definitely get the sense that it's, that it, it is decreasing. Discrimination is decreasing. The public is becoming more accepting. Um, LGBT families are seen more and more as ordinary families, which we are. Um, that being said, however, um, we still have the, the incidents, the one-off incidents that you hear about, like when a couple goes to a and b a lesbian couple and they're told, oh, you can't, you know, have stay in the same room. And it's just like, okay, why do you care? But, uh, but on the whole, I think the public, the public is, you know, with us. It is, like we said, the laws that are catching up. We, we've seen some pretty strong polling on this that um, really, I believe that if the amendment campaign had been um, over, you know, the course of, of a, a longer period of time that we would have won. And you can see that reflected in, in polling data. So we're um, over 60% uh, in terms of North Carolinians who believe there should be uh, 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 re relationship recognition for same-sex same couples of some sort. It's really a pretty small minority at this point in the state who feel um, that there should be no recognition. And I realize, as Sean said, that that doesn't mean that in every, in every community across the state that um, Folks are welcome with open arms, but I will say, as um, you know, as our staff travels the state, it really, it really does move outside of just. It's not just a triangle thing. It's not just a Charlotte thing. I think that there's been movement, and you know, we see it in Greenville and Hickory and New Bern. Um, as as stories get told, people people have moved very fast on this. Other questions? Other com final comments from the panel. I was just going to say, you know, Chantal and I had our wedding in 2003. So in, in Mill Spring, North Carolina, I don't think there's a post office there. It's like outside of Lake Lure, really, I mean, it's, it's like a dot, a little baby dot. And um, we were really committed then. So that's pre-Massachusetts. I think it's pre-Vermont. Um, I think Canada had just legalized marriage. Um, and we were really committed to a North Carolina local wedding, like, trout from the trout farm, local caterer, like everything is close geographically because both of us have worked in the summer at various places in, in North, Western North Carolina and fell in love with the mountains before we fell in love with each other. So it was really important that we, we, we got married there. That was really important to us. And I have to say, I mean, even though it was very, a very painful experience to, to like walk up to a farm and say, you know, can we use your hay bales to just have at our wedding? And they're like, where's the husbands? Or is this a dual wedding? People were real confused. But in general, <laughs> in general, people were really nice, overwhelmingly. And so I also think a big part of it is, is this visibility piece. It's about being out. And for our straight friends and colleagues to, to also be out about being straight friends and colleagues. Um, and 
most people really rise to the occasion. I find when you meet people with your own humanity, they do the same. And, um, and that, that was true in 2003, and I think that's increasingly true as, you know, I mean, it's really hard, especially with our kids around, to think we're real bad people, because they're so cute, and, you know, they're just, they're, they're awesome, and so, um, I think that's true for all of the families within, within our, our, our lawsuit, so, <laughs> I definitely think that um, continuing a commitment to being out, and to being integrated um, into the communities that we're a part of in North Carolina is a huge part of, of the, the puzzle. Are there any other, are there events that are coming up? Are there developments at the national level? Other <coughs> states that, you know, are on the horizon that we should be on the lookout for? We know Illinois just made some great progress in recent weeks. I, I think the national community is very optimistic that the New Mexico Supreme Court will rule in favor of the freedom to marry sooner rather than later. Uh, there's a good Supreme Court out there. Uh, I think um, at that point you're starting to look at potentially Oregon in 2014 having a referendum on the ballot that they feel optimistic that they could uh, pass. But you know, one of the reasons uh, that these conversations are so important and what Marcy says is so important about <coughs> being active allies is that at a certain point you look at the map and the map gets a lot more challenging on a state by state level. We have run through the easy states, you know? Like, the, the map gets more challenging from here. And so once we get New Mexico, once we get Oregon, you're, you know, I think we'll probably win in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, these are more challenging states just from a referendum standpoint. And that's why, you know, demographics are gonna help us but also when you look at the statistics and you unpack them, a third of people have changed their minds on the marriage issue. That number is going to increase as these stories continue to get told. And it's incumbent upon us and it's our responsibility to keep telling those stories and keep changing those minds so we can get you know, political solutions wherever we can, but also create an atmosphere where judges feel um, that they're not going to be stepping, you know, too far out on a limb here. No, one more question. I mean, with Joe just being bought off at election time, <laughs> that your dreams can be just dreams. <laughs> 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 I'm sure you're going to answer that. Yeah, yes. <laughs> of course, we're taping this. Um, that, that's like the question: Have you stopped beating your wife? <laughs> <laughs> I. What I will say is this. I think that there are fantastic, both progressive and conservative jurisprudential reasons for ruling for the freedom to marry. I don't think that this, I, the conservative case here is very easy to make. And the, the, the case is, why do you care? <laughs> what role should the government have in dictating individual <coughs> choices? That is a profoundly confusing conservative argument. So I, you know, I, I feel like we, we can argue it from any different angle because the arguments are strong across the board. I don't care what judges we get in front of in the middle district. I don't care what panel we get at the Fourth Circuit, which has gotten a lot better. Um, but I just think that there is a compelling case to be made regardless of the judge that, that, that we're in front of. And I, and I think judges are also savvy enough to know uh, which way the wind is blowing. Let's say it one more time, knowandlove.org. That's the website to yes. check out. Hope you all will do that, folks watching online. Um, unless we have other one going, going, going. Thank you all for coming. Uh, next. Okay. Next, Tuesday, next Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, we'll be having a Crucial Conversation breakfast with Lynn Quincy, who is uh, with Consumer Reports and Consumers Union. She'll be here to talk about the truth about the Affordable Care Act. So that's obviously a topical issue these days. We hope you can join us then. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next time. Appreciate it. Thank you.